All right, guys, my name is Sam, and uh, welcome to another video. And today we have a special guest who is uh, certainly way prettier and talented than I am with this kind of stuff, Miss Kat Kattenson. Welcome, Kat. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, we're going to start by mentioning something that I was talking about in, uh, in my email to you, which is of the approved narrative of a lot of things, including this trans ideology or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I remember a couple of weeks ago, I tried to make this blog by myself and I just couldn't do it. I kept bombing mainly because of the fact that I don't have the personal experience that you have with this stuff. So let me begin. I want to mention something that doesn't seem relevant at first, but it does. And you'll, you'll see why. Um, lottery winners. You know how 70% of them go broke? They miss a golden opportunity to say whatever they want and never get canceled. Because think about it. What, what's, what's the lottery commission going to do? Say, oh, you said something offensive, give us the money back? No, of course not. But in my opinion, you shouldn't have to be a lottery winner, famous comedian, or, um, or, or, or talking head on a conservative uh, news program to say stuff that falls outside the approved narrative. I, I, you know, that's just my personal opinion on that. Um, and I apologize if I'm talking long-winded. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. All right. Um, based, no, there is something here. You, from what I understand, from your watching your videos, you were a detransition woman, meaning you born female, transitioned to male, and then back to female again. Now, I was um, watching some of your videos, and um, yeah, I apologize. The first time with a special guest, my apologies. But anyway, um, and you were saying that there was an underlying reason for your gender dysphoria. I think it was internalized misogyny or something like that. Um, can you share a little, for the first time viewers here, can you share a little bit about your story regarding that and how you came to be with maybe, you know, transitioning to male wasn't for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my life, I had several traumatic experiences uh, specifically related to my biological sex when I was very young. Um, I don't know how much detail I, sh I should really go into here. But, they don't have to, um, though. But basically, like, I, you know, it made me feel unsafe being, um, being a girl or being a woman. And, like, this was just instilled in me very early on. And it became very subconscious. Uh, and then there was just various sort of subliminal messages that I got from the media as well as, you know, people in my life, like I, I was very gifted in math and science, um, but I never really, uh, I wasn't ever encouraged to go into that. Um, it was more like, oh, you're a girl, you're done with math, good, you know, math is hard for girls. Um, and so, what? you know, Come on. <laughs> and just, you know, lots of stereotypes. I mean, especially I'm a bit older, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 30. I'm, 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 I should say I'm older than a lot of people who are transitioning now. Um, but, you know, when I was a kid, I, I think, um, well, I don't know, I won't say that the stereotypes are still pretty prevalent today. I think this ideology is actually making them worse rather than better. Um, but yeah, so I just kind of internalized all that. And, you know, uh, before I um, came out as trans, I also I, I also suffered from an eating disorder and some other uh, mental health conditions like depression, anxiety. And um, so, yeah, just all of that. Uh, once I learned about being trans, that you could be trans, which I wasn't, and it wasn't until I was 13 years old that I found out about it. That was when I just started to chalk up all of my problems to gender dysphoria, because I'd always felt uncomfortable being a woman. And I'd, I'd always felt like I was, you know, meant to be born a boy. And so it just kind of, it's, it conveniently sense, simplifies your narrative because instead of being like, oh, well, I'm a girl with all of these mental health issues and traumatic experiences, you can be like, well, no, I'm fine. I just have gender dysphoria because I'm really a man. So yeah, I, I, it took me a really long time to actually uncover that all the underlying issues that were there, but it absolutely was a big factor for me. Okay. And so of course, that's when you decided to detransition when you found out that transitioning wouldn't have fixed the underlying issues. Uh, Kind of, um, the, the main reason that I detransitioned um, 
originally was because of health issues and because oh, okay. of, so I was a professional singer before transitioning. Well, semi-professional, I wasn't like fully paying the bills with it or anything like that, but I was doing paid gigs and, um, I, and singing was so important to me. And, um, when I took testosterone, my voice not only deepened, but I acquired a, um, vocal disability because of it. And oh, wow. so I, I have a permanently ho- hoarse and raspy voice. Um, now and I can't really project my voice like I used to and so I, I had to stop performing and that was like heartbreaking for me and that along with some health Imagine. issues I was having I was like I just can't keep going with this transition and um, so after that was when I kind of like started to question my beliefs a little bit I started to question like does this narrative really make sense like I feel like this kind of led me down a bad path or at least one that you know, was damaging for me. And then I heard of other people and them having similar stories. So that was when I started to question the narrative and my beliefs shifted a bit. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, and that was when the, uh, sorry. And that was when I kind of actually, you know, I was like, I can't live as trans anymore. This isn't working out. So that was when I started, um, you know, I, I went back to therapy. I, also got back in tune with like my spirituality and meditation. And that was when I sort of started to confront some of these underlying issues that I, I sort of covered up with like the gender dysphoria narrative. Oh, okay. All right. I mean, yeah, it's good that you found yourself and that you're here right now. Um, I want to start off before I get to something regarding what you went through. I just want to mention something, the Leah Thomas thing. I know that you said your piece. Um, See, my personal opinion on that is I don't know enough about women swimming to really comment fully on the issue. But um, I did a little bit of research on HRT and someone who went through male puberty and then someone who 22 years of testosterone, you can't reverse that in a year and a half of HRT from what I researched. And it doesn't matter if he, sorry, I, I don't want to miss pronoun anyone, you know, but. <laughs> well, it doesn't really bother me, but I do understand for YouTube, you know, some creators try to use they, them, or just use names if, if they don't feel comfortable using pronouns, but yeah. Well, I'll just call Leah she for right now, just for reference purposes. But um, from what I researched about um, HRT for transgender women, it only affects like things like, um, was a bone density, but it doesn't affect things like muscle mass, heart size, wingspan, things like that. So you can argue that she definitely does have a biological advantage. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's so much more. The differences between, you know, males and females are, you know, they're, they're, they exist even before puberty. Like, I mean, really they exist close to conception. There are differences and, um, you know, and especially post puberty, of course, it's all the things you just listed. It's not only, it it can't be chalked up to just hormone levels. Like it's bone structure, bone density, heart, lungs, like all that stuff. So, and, and probably a bunch of things that we don't even know about yet. So absolutely HRT is not, you know, particularly for that time frame, um, it's just not enough to erase biological advantages. Oh, yeah. And what I find even worse than that, though, is when I and I was wondering why in the world are the female swimmers that are competing against her awfully quiet. And then I did a little research on it, did a little reading, and it turns out that not just UPIN, but schools around the country are basically threatening the female singer, sorry, the female swimmers, got my words mixed up here, but the schools are threatening the female swimmers with various forms of punishment if they speak up about this. And I, I don't understand why we're living in a world where if you have a legitimate right, right, you can be punished for speaking up about it. And the reason why is because they're going against the approved narrative on this kind of stuff. And I apologize in advance, but I'm going to make a car analogy that I hope makes sense for the viewers that are into that stuff because I'm a car guy. And that would be like a racing series, um, you know, having a certain class where anybody can compete and you can have any engine modification, but your engine can only have a max 500 horsepower to make things fair. But then BMW decides, you know what, this series is pretty lucrative. Let's offer our factory backed race car that somebody can buy from one of our dealers, say an M4. 
So some of the teams buy this car and all of a sudden it starts kicking everybody's ass. And then somebody raises a concern saying, there's no way that car has 500 horsepower. So somebody borrows a friend's car from a friend of his who has one. They dyno it and it actually is making over well over 800 horsepower. Now, number one, it wouldn't be fair to the other competitors. And what they're doing to these female swimmers is the equivalent to this racing organization, you know, hearing complaints that it's not fair for this car to compete by saying, well, you, you can't say anything because it'll be deemed racist against Germans. And if you say anything, we'll pull your license. It's the same type of deal in principle. And I apologize if that didn't make sense, but um, that's the closest thing that I could consider. No, that's a, that's a good analogy. Um... For sure. I actually, I saw a bumper sticker the other day. This just reminded me of it, but it was like this huge truck, but it's bumper sticker said, I identify as a Prius. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. I saw that before. That was hilarious. That, you know? But anyway, oh, and by the way, that is actually has a real life, not a hypothetical. I'm a big fan of NHRA drag racing and a lot of the big three manufacturers, Ford, Chevy, and Chrysler came out with uh, factory back race only versions of their muscle cars to compete in and they were starting to kick everybody's ass in in the class of stock eliminator and it turns out that when a, a friend of, a, of one of the guys that has one of the i think of one of those copo camaros took one dynoed it and even though chevy was rating at a 580 the actual horsepower was like close to 1200 oh wow but yeah that's why i was kicking everybody's ass so but so the, from what I understand, the guys who had the less powerful older cars went to, went to the NHRA and complained. And instead of basically shutting them down and telling them, no, you just have to accept it. They created a whole new class for these new cars called factory stock showdown and everybody's happy. So, and my mother actually was saying that maybe transgenders should compete against each other instead of competing with the biological females. And it's viable. I don't know how many transgender athletes are going to be able to get that can fill can fill a category though um there is one thing i want to mention about the approved narrative and i actually um saw this on a post you liked a whole thread by this person on twitter in the morning and it's interesting and i'm going to say the following that as a disclaimer this is not um you know targeted at the transgender population who you know, have gender dysphoria so bad that wasn't caused by an underlying condition that either for them, it was either transition or suicide. I'm not trying to trash those people or bash them in any way, but I'm trying to get down to what is causing, you know, parents and medical professionals to rush to affirm and, you know, transition teenagers. That's really what I want to try to get to and ask questions. And to me, I think that a certain word loses its meaning when, how do I say this? When it, when it, when you use it to describe everything. And to me, asking questions and wanting answers is not transphobic. Absolutely. And I, I want to add that it's not just teenagers. Um, the transition process is starting as young as 10, to my knowledge. Um, That's a little ridiculous with, to me. Yes. And it's, it's beginning with, um, you know, one of the, one of the things in the narrative is that puberty blockers are fully reversible and they're that, not from what I understand. Yeah, absolutely not. There's, uh, you know, sterility, uh, osteoporosis, um, brain or, uh, stunted brain development are all, um, st risks that have been shown, uh, have been supported by science. So, but anyway, um, so that process can start as young as 10. And then I, I believe that uh, surgeries can happen as young as 12 or 13, uh, top surgeries. And then there are uh, reassignment surgeries happening before the age of 18 as well. Wow. Um, I'll get to all that in, in a bit later on, but I just want to mention something about that. I have always, oh, before I get to my main point, before I forget, see, I'm a man of logic and reasoning and logic and reasoning to me would be to, if someone has gender dysphoria, wouldn't it be logical to work on the underlying condition first and see if the gender dysphoria goes away instead of rushing to affirm and transition someone? Well, at the very least, you know, there are certain conditions that should raise red flags. Um, you know, there's, there's certain um, mental health conditions that can kind of, uh, what's the right word, make you feel dissociated from your body or have 
identity identity crises, um, like borderline personality disorder is one. Um, autism, and autism isn't a mental illness, but um, you know it can cause. Uh, I well, I have friends who are autistic, and uh, um, you know it, it just causes you to relate to yourself and have a sense of self that's different than how most people um, kind of relate to themselves. And then, um, and then you know, of course, like eating disorders. Um, of course, like schizophrenia and severe bipolar disorder, um, where you can have delusions. I, I actually read a story of a schizophrenic man who, um, during psychosis, had had the operation and um, and and was fully psychotic, and then uh, you know woke up and was sex reassigned, and uh, you know Damn. just crazy things like that, which are rare. But you know that's that's more the extreme. But absolutely, these mental health issues should be examined and explored. Um, before just jumping to a firm, because that's a, that's a decision that's permanent and, uh, you know, messing with your hormones. Like if someone doesn't already have mental illness, uh, you know, causing a, artificially causing a hormone imbalance, uh, can definitely cause, cause mental health problems as well. Yeah. And like I said, it would make sense to target those instead of target just the gender dysphoria. And one thing I do want to mention is that, um, TRAs, the trans rights activists, will constantly argue that, you know, the suicide rate for transgender people are really high. And it is true. Statistically, it is. Um, but I personally find it hard to believe now that I'm looking into all this stuff, courtesy of you and other detransitioners, that 100% of those suicides can't be caused by people harassing them or ostracizing them. There has to be a percentage of those suicides that happen because they realize, oh, shoot, what have I done? Because transitioning only shoved their issues to the side. It didn't actually fix it. And it makes me wonder if some of those um, suicides are caused by the fact that they went into a deeper depression because of the fact that they were transitioned before actually fixing any other underlying issues they may have. Right, absolutely. And when you look at the studies on mental health before and after transitioning, well, first of all, the dropout rates are a lot of times anywhere from 20 to 60% of the participants drop out by the end of the study. Um, so these studies that claim, you know, transitioning results in mental health benefits, uh, you know, if you have 60% of the, of the participants dropping out, then you really don't know what happened to them. And, um, you know, and sadly, and, you know, I empathize with this a lot as, as someone who's suffered from severe depression, um, Sadly, in the longer studies, the suicide rate doesn't go down. It, it remains, uh, I think, 20 times elevated over the general population, even after the surgeries. So, you know, even after everything that's, according to the narrative, supposedly helps them is given, um, you don't see this sharp increase in uh, mental health as, as they suggest that you should. So, you know, this, none of this is backed up by solid science. Um, like any study that has more than a 20% dropout rate is considered at a high risk of bias. So just the fact that these are such um, intensive medical interventions and like, uh, I can't think of the word I'm invasive. They're so invasive. Yeah. Yet we, you know, the fact that we don't have solid evidence backing this up is very, very concerning, especially when it comes to minors. Oh, I agree. And, you know, I've always said this, that whenever there is a movement or ideology, in order to keep it on the straight and narrow and on the track, so to speak, you have to be willing to offend some people. Otherwise, what will happen is that if you're too afraid to offend a tiny section of, of people, you're going to make that particular movement or ideology go off the rails. And I think that the issue with um, trend, with you know the whole transgender gender ideology involving children, I think personally that not only has the train you know sped up and went off the tracks, it has derailed and caused a huge me a huge mess, and nobody wants to clean it up. Um, I'll give you an example. Now I don't know if you've seen these um, these photos, but I remember. I can't pronounce her um, her Twitter handle, so I'll just say call her by her first name. Helena shared it. Um, Athena, I think she goes by Mother Gender on Twitter. Um, she also shared it, and this th th there, th sorry, there is a person on Twitter who shared four images of titled. Uh, uh, I apologize. I'm 
paraphrasing here because I don't remember exactly what it said because this person protected their tweets because a bunch of people were harassing him or her about it. But they were these four pictures were titled "Signs You That." that you may be doing something as a, as a um, subconscious coping mechanism for gender dysphoria. And one of them was, let's see, you know what? I'm going to bring up my Facebook and I apologize for uh, this. Hopefully you can still see me. Yeah, I can still see you. Okay, I think good. I might know which photo you're talking about, but I'm not positive. So I'll wait for you to pull it up. Okay. Um, Okay, here we go. Um, the first one is that, well, oh, this is what it said. Things that are likely a, the things that are a likely subconscious coping mechanism for gender dysphoria. Now, they, this person shared four images and all of them said each one of these things. Number one, if you hate the sound of your voice in recordings videos. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's so stupid. You know, the one of the reasons why I hate doing these videos is because I personally hate the sound of my voice. I'm going to admit it. Does that mean I'm trans? No, obviously not. Um, I think that, you know, literally 99.9% .9 of the population um, <laughs> it doesn't like their voice recorded. So Yes, uh, exactly. And number two, if you have an eating disorder, which I'll get to in, in a bit, but I'm going to finish these. Number three, if you dislike changes to your body after puberty or feel depressed when things like school dress code violations happen to you, maybe wrong on that latter part, by the way, don't, don't quote me 100% of that. And four, this is the one that shocked me and kind of pissed me off the most. If you have a strong desire to partake in a hobby or profession not normally associated with your birth, with your birth gender. Okay, I'm sorry, but that's incredibly dumb. I mean, and listen, even if I was a 100% completely politically new and socially neutral person, when I saw these, I wasn't thinking, eh, they're just trying to offer support. I, when I saw these, I thought, holy crap, they're trying to recruit people. And when I say recruit, I'm not talking about how the army recruits people. I'm talking about the fact that why the hell are they trying to convince as many people as possible that they have GD? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I wonder things like that myself. Uh, another thing is like the, the, uh, the whole idea of a trans egg, like basically anyone who's gender non-conforming or I don't know, uh, maybe same sex attracted, um, you know, they could be just a trans egg and, you know, one day they're going to hatch and come out of the egg and come out as trans. And, you know, uh, and that, you know, anyone who wonders if they're trans or questions it is probably trans because, you know, cis people don't ever like question their gender. So if you're questioning at all, you probably are. And, you know, these are the types of things that I've heard and, and pictures like that, that you just shared. It's, it does feel like recruitment. And like, I, I mean, my theory was that, and still is to some extent that I just think that whenever a new person comes out at trans, it comes out as trans, it really does sort of confirm the ideology um, and support the beliefs of everyone who already identifies that way. So, you know, it makes them feel stronger in their identities and like makes the movement feel like it's getting stronger. And that was kind of what I thought about it, but just with this push to like medicalize people and how much money yeah. is being made by like pharmaceutical companies and stuff, like I really do feel like there is a more nefarious agenda coming from higher up. Um, and, you know, I just can't really unsee it at this point with, with some of the things I've noticed happening. You know, I was just about to say that um, normally I have um, a phrase I like to use whenever you see stuff happen like this, and it's always follow the money. Um, I know that, you know, unlike same sex marriage, um, there is a big um, financial ramifications for various entities if they legalize cannabis, namely the fact that pharmaceuticals don't want it to happen. I would like it to happen in my lifetime, but who knows? But anyway, don't want to get too detoured. Um, but you're right, and I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, the one thing that shocked me out of those four pictures that this person shared, though, is the you might be interested in a profession or hobby not normally associated with your birth gender. And I can tell you right now that 20 years ago, if a woman wanted to be an engineer or a mechanic, she would be lauded and given an girl. Now, 
if she was in therapy and she mentioned to her therapist that she wants to be a mechanic in, when she graduates high school, I'm scared that her therapist will try to convince her that she has GD and that the only way she'll, she'll be happy is if she transitions. It, it, it's almost getting to that point. Um, uh, yeah, I had a doctor tell me, um, literally a doctor told me that, um, you know, they had asked me what my college major was. And at the time I was, uh, I started as mathematics and then I switched to biochemistry, but like, I, I said that, um, yeah, well, I'm going to mathematics and the doctor literally said, well, you shouldn't be a woman if, if you're going to study calculus and stuff. So I almost you do, you just... do have professionals saying this, this type of thing. So like, absolutely. And then when you try to confront it and you say, you know, a lot of this feels like it's just based on stereotypes. Um, they just, they, they vehemently disagree and, you know, tell you that you're being uh, bigoted or, or whatever, um, insensitive for saying that, but these are literally the types of things that trans activists and allies will, will say to people. Okay. If you notice, I was almost, I, I'm trying to be as neutral as possible here, but that almost made me want to take my headset and throw it across the room. Okay. Um, listen, I'm a car and racing fan. There are so many female drivers in the NHRA and it's a good thing that a lot of them are in their thirties because there's quite a few of them that I'm afraid as soon as they mention that they want to go into cars and racing that, that they might, you know, think that there's like a subconscious coping mechanism for it. And I don't get that. I mean, you know, you would think that people would be proud to see a woman wanting to enter a male dominated field, not try to trans them for it, which is almost what it's looked like is happening. Um, and, you know, when this first started, when I, when I, when I saw that, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm a fan of the Netflix uh, car show, Car Masters, and their mechanic is a very beautiful woman, but woman by the name of um, Constance Nunes. And I was thinking to myself, it's a good thing she's 30, not 15, because can you imagine if she was 15 years old in today's climate? As soon as she mentioned that she was into cars and racing, they would probably try to trans her. And it, it's crazy to even think about. And what you mentioned about eating disorders, by the way, I want to touch on that because I remember when Helena posted this and she got hundreds of comments about it. And she said that it seems to be that there's an alarmingly high number of girls going into treatment for eating disorders and coming out suddenly identifying as male. And I personally don't understand how a treatment center can go from eating disorder to want to change genders. I don't, I failed to see how they could come to that. Yeah, um, well, I, I can understand how it could seem from an outsider's perspective, seem confusing, but in both cases, um, you know, adolescent girls, there's, there's a lot that happens during female puberty that can make you feel uncomfortable with your body. Just the fact that it's changing so fast and the way society responds to you, uh, it, it changes a lot just like that. You know, it's, it's like the way I put it before is like, you go from kind of being seen as a child in society's eyes to being seen as like a sexual object. And it really happens a lot of times within the course of like a year or two, your body can just like totally change. And, um, and so that's really uncomfortable for, um, for girls, especially like if, if you're someone who has already questioned your gender or like suffered from gender dysphoria, um, it's like, you know, suddenly like when you go through puberty, it's kind of like, you, it just becomes so obvious that you are like the sex that you are. Um, and so eating disorders and like transgenderism for young girls in both cases, you are trying to escape having a female body basically with email, with email. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't worry about it. I flub about more times than that. <laughs> with, uh, with having an eating disorder, you're basically erasing your curves. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of girls who have had like, like sexual trauma or abuse, um, you know, they're very uncomfortable with having curves. Um, or even if you haven't had sexual trauma, but if you've, you know, your body's just changing really fast, you're uncomfortable, maybe you're teased like I was um, for your body, it, it can just, it can cause you to like psychologically want to get rid of those curves and sort of go back to more of like a childlike or more masculine um, aesthetic. 
And so then, you know, another way that that can be achieved, another way that you can hide having a female body is through transitioning because, you know, testosterone will change the way fat is redistributed and puberty blockers will stop you from developing curves. So, um, you know, I think as in, in addition to like the, the LGB kids that are being trans because a lot of times they're gender nonconforming, um, and same sex attracted, it's, it's also people with eating disorders that are just uncomfortable in their bodies, you know, getting, getting trans as well. And so there's just, there's a ton of overlap between girls who identify as trans and girls with eating disorders. Yeah. I, a friend of mine told me that. And I think it's because the fact that the treatment centers will oftentimes mistake, you know, wanting to do something about that with wanting to escape femaleness. I'm hoping you know, I'm not butchering that or misspeaking, but, um, and I recently posted something about that on Facebook and a friend of mine who I'm not going to say his name, but he said, you sound like the type of person who would, you know, in a situation where if you had a daughter and if you sent her to an eating disorder, send her to a treatment center for an eating disorder, you sound like the type of person who would act like he knows more than, uh, than this, than the professionals and start screaming at them saying, why the hell are you transing my daughter just for an eating disorder? And to be honest with you, yes, yes, I would. I would question them as to how they got from eating disorder to wanting to, you know, pump herself full of testosterone and cutting her boobs off. That is, I would, I'm sorry, but I would. Well, in that case you should. I mean, all parents, you know, and, and I, I don't, people are going to get mad at me because I'm, I'm not a parent saying this, but, you know, someone that's saying it's okay for a child to make irreversible decisions to their bodies, like, you know, parents need to call that out. And it's like, just because a doctor is saying that, like, it, it's just, you know, critical thinking is just so important. And I understand there's pressure to like, to trans kids, you know, um, I've talked with a lot of parents who, you know, their child's pediatrician has been pressuring them to sign off on puberty blockers and things like that. So I get that, but it's just, you know, I, the first thing I tell parents, if, if they're wondering what to do is like, just don't do puberty blockers, you know, even if you've already like affirmed the kids like identity or whatever, like just that will save them the brain damage and just all these other effects. But anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that these treatment centers, um, I went to eating disorder treatment as a teenager. And um, at that point, thankfully, they weren't ideologically captured. I also went to a Christian treatment center. So, you know, that may, may, may have been a blessing in disguise. But um, I mean, so many doctors, pediatricians uh, are, are ideologically captured. So I'm sure the same is true with, with treatment centers. And it's like once a kid says they have gender dysphoria, it's, it's now against the law in some places like Canada. There's actually a bill right now in California that would do something similar. Um, once the kid That's says insane. that it's gender dysphoria, it is, they're just not allowed to question it anymore. And, you know, it, it's suddenly like, oh, well, that trauma you experienced, uh, you know, your, your discomfort with your body. Well, that's, that's just because you're a man. Um, <laughs> so it's pretty insane. All right. Well, I've always said, and in principle, this is kind of similar. There are parents who won't feed their young children certain foods because they're like, oh my God, what if they're allergic to them? Well, I've always said that if you refuse to feed your kids certain foods when they're young, that's the, that's the quickest way to guarantee a food allergy. It's the same thing with this. If you just rush into affirmation only and don't try to look and see if there's an underlying cause of the child's dinner dysphoria, that might actually guarantee that they might commit suicide later on or at least heighten the chance. But that's, that, that, that's just my opinion. I don't know if it's yours, but, um, and by the way, one thing I want to mention is that the, when you said irreversible procedures, now I actually do watch a couple of videos by trans YouTubers because it always pays to see what they have to say, you know, to see other sides perspectives. And there was a video that Sam Collins put out recently. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a transgender guy. And he recently was responding to some of the things that Matt Walsh was saying. Now, there is people who are accused of being transphobic just because of asking questions. And then there is people who are legitly transphobic and assholeish. And Matt Walsh is one of those people. But um, one of the things that Sam Collins said that 
I don't agree with at all after after seeing some Twitter posts is he said they are not performing surgeries on children. That's not true. You know, no. Ath- Athena got top surgery at 16. Recently, there was a viral uh, story that went viral on Twitter of a 15 year old girl that got top surgery. So uh, like Sam Collins, I think that he produces good uh, content as far as entertainment value wise, but he's wrong on that issue. And that's really yeah. it. that's really all I have to say about that. And Jamie Dodger is a is a British uh, trans man who I'm was familiar. yeah he reacted to the Abigail Schreier Prager U. Now there's a lot of reasons why I don't like Prager U, but the um, he was reacting to the video they put out of I think when when girls become boys. And look, I'm not going to try to imitate Jamie Dodger's accent. You know he can't help having that. But one thing that I, but one thing that I will say is when he made a comment because Lisa Littman coined the term rapid onset gender dysphoria or, or ROGD, and Jamie Dodger made a statement that I don't think is entirely true. He said rapid onset gender dysphoria doesn't exist and it's caused irreparable harm to the transgender community. And I don't, I don't think it doesn't exist because Selena has explained her her story many times and also wrote that great substack piece about it but if you remember earlier i was saying that and like i said it could be wrong about one of those memes saying it but one of the things that those you know subconscious coping mechanism meme said is you might be depressed about um you know getting school dress code violations all the time and i think to be honest with you what's causing rapid onset gender dysphoria no matter how many times the trans community tries to deny it is the way we're treating both boys and girls, both in society and school, really does times, in my opinion, want to make someone escape their, their their birth sex. I mean, it starts with boys in school, and they hear society and schools basically accusing the basically the male species of um, being responsible for everything what's wrong in the world, you know. You know, wars are started because of you, this and that and horrible things and men are trash. And it really can cause after constantly hearing that, you know, someone, a young child, a young boy, 15, 16, or saying, you know what, screw this crap. I'm transitioning. I want to escape maleness. And I don't know if you, um, you know, if you agree with that or not, but that's just my personal take on that side. Well, I personally know someone who um you know started identifying as not uh they're a male person and they started identifying as non-binary because they didn't want to be associated with like toxic masculinity and like predatory male behavior and that was you know how the what they thought of as of the definition of man is like you know (laughs) I don't even know what what you would call that um but it's like it's it's just so frustrating to me because there there are so many ways to be a man and so many ways to be a woman um you know it's just like to me a woman is an adult human female and a man is just an adult human male and you know we don't need to attach um like any of those toxic stereotypes i mean i i think it's important to be like aware of the statistics on like male violence and for women to be like protected from that by having their own spaces and you know and likewise men deserve their own spaces as well um but yeah, I, I do think that demonizing men could be could be a part of this whole thing and just having a very narrow understanding of what it means to be a man and like what is considered acceptable male behavior. I, I think all of that contributes for sure. Exactly. And on the female side of things, um, and I remember reading this on, was it Reddit? It was somewhere else, maybe. But basically what happened was, is that before news organizations started picking up on all these, you know, school age girls constantly getting sent to the principal's office for dress code violations. And when you see what they're wearing, like, really, they consider that a problem. And there was someone who spoke up about it on this forum. Sorry, pause for water. But, uh, and she said that, this woman posted that, listen, I'm 26 years old now, but when I was starting 15, 16, um, I started having problems with constantly being dress coded. And first off, my issue was that I developed early 
And by 16, I had, well, I don't want to say the word, but I guess you can say that she was fairly well endowed. And uh, she said that no matter what she wore, she was constantly being sent to the principal's office for violating her school's dress code. She would wear a sleeveless shirt. That wasn't allowed. She would wear a tank top. That wasn't allowed. And she couldn't wear anything baggy because it would make her look kind of fat. I know that some people don't like that word nowadays, but I mean, there's no easier other way to say it. And finally, one time she decided to wear a tighter shirt of one of her favorite bands, and she still got sent to the principal's office. And she was like, what's so, you know, this is a shirt with sleeves. It's not showing anything. Why am I being sent here? And the principal says it was too tight. You were distracting the boys. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what do you, what do you expect girls to wear? Standard. Yeah, it's 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 such a double a double standard, and it definitely is harder for you know women with larger breasts to you know not appear sexual because it's just it, like it's just the shape of their body, and like I I didn't have you know I I, I wouldn't say I was like abnormal abnormally like noticeable in that way, but I um. I didn't mean abnormal in like a bad way. I just meant like, you know, atypical, I guess. Um, but oh, okay. yeah, going through puberty and like just suddenly having a completely different body shape than you did. It's like, it's, it's hard. You don't just automatically know how to dress for that. And um, yeah. And it's just, it's such a double standard that boys can literally be shirtless when they're like practicing football or whatever, or like at um, like when I was in high school, um, I guess they don't call it recess in high school, but you know, like lunch break or whatever. Like I would see like boys out on the football field. They like, call it rec room activity. <laughs> or I was, yeah, I went. Like that. Well, um, you know, and, and then, you know, girls, it's like, you can't even wear a spaghetti strap um, or you can't have your shirt be too low cut. And you've got boys wearing the shirts with like the giant armholes, you know, underneath where you can basically <laughs> see everything. And, uh, and, and it, it is, it's like, the, the reason they give is like it's too sexual or you know it's will distract the boys which yeah it's distracting to the boys and uh it's just it, it makes it does make you feel even more uncomfortable in your body as a girl than you already would and it just kind of I guess reinforces the idea that like our, our bodies are somehow shameful or disruptive to society exactly so. you know what I gotta say um that can definitely cause a, a teenage girl to develop ROGD, you know? And the reason why I brought this, this, this woman's story up is, no, oh, sorry, <laughs> no problem. It's cool. Um, the reason why I brought this woman's story up and I'm, and I remember reading this and I kind of like forgot about it. And then all this talk kind of brought it back to me as I was mentally rehearsing what I was going to say in this blog. And I think that what she said, because she actually went to therapy because she said that in, in, in the forum post that it sent her into a depression. And so during a therapy session, she blurted out that sometimes I wish I was a boy, maybe I wouldn't have all these problems. And her therapist said something that made me think that would never be able to happen today. Her therapist told her, no, you're a beautiful woman a beautiful young lady. And you have to remember that. And you also have to remember that whatever bad things, you know, bad people's behavior towards you is a result of the people themselves, not you. You're not at fault for this. You cannot think like this. Never blame yourself for the things that other people do to you. And that set her straight. And someone commented saying, you know, if that was to happen today, your therapist would put you on hormones and surgeries. And basically convince you that that your depression over dress coded is because of gender dysphoria. And of course, some dummy had to come in and say, oh, let's not get transphobic here. I'm thinking, what? How is that transphobic? But that's one thing I wanted to bring up. And you know, it's a combination of how boys are looked at in society and then how girls are oftentimes, like you said, treated, which could result in a rapid onset gender dysphoria, gender dysphoria sorry. And so to say that ROGD doesn't exist is not true as well I don't think yeah totally um I mean trans activists and trans influencers you know not all trans influencers but the ones who are actively spreading the ideology they say tons of stuff that's blatantly untrue 
And when you call them out for it, they call you transphobic. And just the word transphobic has very little weight or meaning to me anymore because I've just, I've literally gotten called transphobic for sharing my personal story and, you know, things that literally happened to me. Um, so I just, you know, there are a few things like me having being, being someone who has transitioned, uh, you know, there were some, some in instances of what would I, cons what I would consider true transphobia. Um, you know, so it does happen, but I feel like these days, everything is labeled transphobic, like reality is labeled transphobic. So no. I just, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't strike me as this like horrible, you know, horrible thing anymore. But al although I realize, like, you know, when people go to my page on TikTok or Twitter or whatever, um, apparently I'm like a famed transphobe. Uh, I don't understand that at all. You would be the one that I would least think is transphobic, you know, based on your personal experience. And uh, yeah. I mean, I think the word has lost its meaning when you start accusing everybody who merely just asks questions of being right. transphobic. There is true transphobia in the world and asking questions and demanding to know why we're not, you know, treating teenagers for their underlying, you know, issues instead of just, trans instead of just you know, transing them with hormones and surgeries is not transphobic. There's true transphobia and, and that's not it. Now, I want to get a, I just want to mention another movement here that is also went off the rails in my opinion. And that is the me too movement. Now hmm. I, now listen, I'm not going to deny that it had good intentions. And at first it worked as designed. But the problem is though, is that thanks to the fact that we are seemingly afraid of offending a small, tiny group of people, which in this case is the rad fems, that movement has went completely off the rails. And you can tell that the movement has gone off the rails when, when guys are literally afraid to approach women in any sort of setting like bar, restaurant, club, supermarket, whatever, out of fear that they might get accused of you know sexual harassment. And just so you know, I posted on Twitter that Helena posted something, I forgot what it was. And I replied by saying, you know, 10, 20 years ago, if you saw a cute girl at a supermarket, you could try chatting her up, getting her phone number. And the worst she could say is no. I, now, if you try to chat up a cute girl at a supermarket in hopes of getting her number, the worst that'll probably happen is you might get uh, kicked out for sexual harassment. And somebody said, and you could tell this person is one of these rad femish people. She goes, that's because women will no longer tolerate being, you know, hit on and trying to do daily tasks. What? How are we supposed to meet anybody? Yeah. You know, I, like you do, I, I see both sides of the movement. Like, um, like, I think it was really important for like a bunch of women to, to speak up because, um, you know, I think in the past, I mean, still by like by law enforcement and people still dismiss women a lot when they do explain something that happens to them. Like, you know, I, I was talking about something that happened to me the other day and people were just calling me misandrist when I, you know, I'm not I'm not misandrist in the least. And I, I, you know, I don't hate men. And I think in order for men and women to accomplish anything, like I, I think we need to understand each other and um and, and work together. Like, I, I don't really, I feel like men's rights activists just bash women. And, you know, I, I align in many ways with radical feminists, but like, I, I do see like the, the demonization of men. Like, I, I, I'm not going to lie. Like, I do see that. And like, I think it's harmful. I, I also think it's, um, I, I think in some cases, just the lack of proof and the lack of accountability. Like I, you know, I, I, I think the majority of women who will speak out about, you know, being sexually assaulted or harassed, like, I, I think the majority of them are true, you know, um, but I will, yeah. I will admit that, you know, even within women, you know, we're not totally just, I don't know, sanctimonious, like we, we have, there's bad apples who are women and, 
you know, would, I, I think absolutely would say something about someone for personal gain. Like, I, I'm not going to say that that doesn't happen because it absolutely could, you know, so there's, there's good things and there's disadvantages to that movement. And, you know, I, I think there's good sides and bad sides to like almost every movement, like no movement is completely perfect, you know? Oh yeah. And I, so I asked this person as a response, I said, how did, like, where do you propose that men are approved to talk to women? And she goes, dating apps, singles bars, just don't try to hit on her when she's trying to do a daily task. And last year, right, was it during 2020, there was a couple that went viral because of where they decided to have their engagement photos. They decided to have their engagement photos in the, in the uh, place that they met, which was Publix, which is a supermarket chain down here in, down here in Florida. Yep, they actually had their engagement photos down here. So you can't tell me that it's not okay to approach women in a certain setting like that. I mean, there's a risk that she might complain, but how is anybody supposed to meet anyone? And by the way, I, I'm going to tell you a cute story that, um, that of two people I know that, that this happened to. This was back in like the 70s. Back then, there's a gentleman I know who worked at, and by the way, you'll get why I'm telling you this at the end. There's a gentleman I know who um, who worked for his dad at like a auto repair center slash gas station. And they would sometimes broker car sales when someone would come to them with a car to sell and then they would either sell it to someone else privately or sell it at an auction and keep a cut of the money. And there was this woman that came in looking to sell her old Ford Mustang. And... The, the guy that I'm referring to um, recognized her from a local bar and everything, and he was smitten. And this person said to this lady, why are you selling your car? And she goes, I'm trying to, I'm tired of New York. I'm trying to raise funds to move to California. So he goes, before you do that, let me take you out on a date. Here's my, here's my card. Give me a call sometime. This is back in the seventies. So Two days later, and the funny thing is, is that my dad obviously didn't want her to move to California. I mean, well, shoot, I just spoiled it. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, this, he basically, um, every time someone came, uh, stopped to look at the car, this, 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 this gentleman was like, I don't buy this car. It's a piece of junk. It'll break down 10 minutes. Two days later, the lady called him and said, I'll, I'll go out with you. How's that? 40 years later, they're still married and they had me. Those are my parents I'm talking about. Nowadays, can you imagine if a man intentionally sabotaged the sale of a woman's car in an attempt to go out with her? He would be considered sexually harassing her. So, <laughs> so yeah. You know, the thing is, is it's like, I feel like the men who, the ironic thing is like, I, I feel like the men who are concerned about women's feelings and like, wow, should I talk to her? Should I not? I don't want to like, you know, I don't want to bother her. Like, I, I don't want to come off as, you know, too aggressive or whatever. Like, like the men who are like worried about that are like not the ones who are being creepy anyway, because like in my experience, it's like the men who actually are creepy are going to do it. Like, oh, I agree. Regardless, You know, I mean, like I've had, it's funny because like there was this place that I used to go get my oil changed and, you know, um, this guy was like totally creepy hitting on me, like just like wouldn't take no for an answer type of thing. And then um, I don't know if this was related or not, but one time, uh, the last time they actually didn't put new oil in my tank. They just took the old oil out and didn't put new oil in. <laughs> wow. Uh, and yeah, like, I don't know if that had to do with me, like turning him down or whatever, <laughs> but so there's definitely, and of course, like I've had creepy men, you know, hit on me and they seem totally unconcerned that I would report them for sexual harassment or anything. Like it doesn't, it doesn't stop them. And uh, so, yeah, like I, I think the majority of, of men who this is making them think about it more like are, are probably not creepy to begin with. Um, Thank you but for I, saying I totally that. know where you're coming from. And um, you know, I just think like in this age, like, like COVID and just, the explosion of social media and just like act interacting so much more online than we are like in person yeah. anymore. Like, I feel like it has just changed social dynamics so much. And it is kind of like, I mean, how do we meet people? Like what are, 
what are social rules again? Like, I don't know. I, it's like when I've gone back out into public after COVID, like I feel, uh, well, I've always felt a little bit like this, but I, I feel a bit like a robot, like interacting among humans. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I feel like that too. And by the way, the man who was being PPT in that oil change place as a, as a, as a man, we don't claim him. <laughs> okay. But yeah. Um, but that's about, you know, that movement. Now I just wanted to, you know, mention that just to get your opinion on that. Um, and by the way, thank you for saying that about the men who are generally concerned about, about how they might come off. I have a friend of mine who actually thinks the opposite. So thank you very much for saying that. Most men who are concerned are not the creepy ones. And when even Henry Cavill, who was an actor that I can assume that any heterosexual woman would consider a handsome fellow, has stated publicly that he is literally, ever since the Me Too movement happened, of he stated publicly that he's afraid to flirt with women in a public setting because he's afraid that what if one of them misconstrues me and gets... And, and complains. He had to apologize, by the way, for saying that, which to me, he lost major cool points for, but whatever. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. Ugh, geez, I'm sorry. This is when I start to lose. Oh, yeah. By it's the okay. way, yeah, I know. It's a little on the ridiculous side when that happens, but um, yeah, but enough about that. I, um, I want to talk about music for a bit to change gears, so to speak. But before I do, I just want to, oh yeah, that's what I meant to say. I lost my train of thought, but now I, I re-railed it, so to speak. But uh, <laughs> Chris Noth, I don't know. Now listen, if he's guilty of, of what those three women are saying, that's fine. Punishment, whatever they feel is deemed appropriate. But it is awfully interesting to me that before those three women made those accusations, the industry had nothing but good things to say about the guy. And then all of a sudden, three women come forward and boom, he's fired from the equalizer, fired from and, and just like that and, and dropped by his agency. My whole problem with, with making accusations and going off those is we're treating them like guilty verdicts. And where's the due process in all this? I mean, I understand wanting to, you know, keep distance from him until after the accusations prove true or whatever but it just sucks that he had to lose his his gigs because of it over just accusations but that's i mean it is what it is unfortunately in today's society it's a complicated issue you know because i mean like if a woman is actually raped you know i i think the best thing to do is call the police immediately and you know have DNA samples taken and everything, you know, and, and I know it's so uncomfortable to have to do that, but like, I think that is the best thing to do in that situation, because that's basically your only hope of having literal proof of it, you know, and not that people shouldn't believe women, but having proof behind what you say is definitely helpful in terms of the oh, yeah, process. Absolutely. I agree. But, but when it comes to like smaller sort of sexual crimes, like you know, sexual harassment or, um, you know, just like, I don't know, like a man, you know, someone exposing themselves to another person or, or, or something, you know, where you don't really have any literal proof. Like there, you know, there's no way for you to prove unless you were recording or, or, or something like there's no way to prove that the other person actually did that. Um, so on one hand, I think women's concerns get dismissed so much. Um, and I understand how that feels as a woman and, you know, I totally but understand I, I that, also yeah. understand how, like, I understand the other side, like if there isn't any actual proof and, you know, when someone is like, a, uh, they're big, they're a big name or whatever, and everybody knows about them. It's like, you know, it is possible that people could lie and it could still be treated as if they're guilty. Yes. So, you know, exactly. I, I don't really have a clear answer for it because I like I, I guess I understand both sides. And I, I also understand as a woman, like how it feels to to be like this happens to me and people to just be like dismissive and or be like, oh, but, it, you know, it really wasn't that bad or it was your fault or it was, you know, uh, what were you doing being alone with that person or wearing what you were wearing? Like, I, I hate I it when people say that it's too. been, I, you know. <laughs> Whenever somebody says that, it gets me pissed off because it's been proven multiple times that a woman's attire has absolutely no bearing 
on um, whether she or not she's going to be harassed or assaulted. So I hate it when people say that. Um, now, um, before I get to the music thing, because you're a singer and it would be a perfect time to bring up some questions about that. But first, I want to bring up something else, and that I call the personal experience factor. Now, if my if me by myself was talking about the whole trans thing, I probably would be, you know, crapped all over. But because you have a little bit of direct experience, it helps a little bit. But I think the issue I have is that whenever you talk about something, there tends to be a subset of people who automatically dismiss you if you don't have direct experience in what you're talking about. And to me, that's wrong. You know, I don't need to be a to be an artist to appreciate good art. I don't need to be a singer to appreciate and know what good singing sounds like and to know when someone's a great guitar player. And, I and don't you don't need, need <laughs> I was Sorry, just going to say, and you, and you don't need to be a biologist to know who a woman is. You know, um, <laughs> not to I be real, to too, that, you know, I know. And personally speaking, by the way, um, not to derail or get too political here, but I think that the reason why Judge Jackson said that is because she knew that if she gave a, an honest, real answer, the TRAs would come down on her. But that's besides the point. And she was trying to be neutral. I get that. But anyway, back to the point I was trying to make. Um, there was one time when I was talking to a fellow car enthusiast at my job about Danica Patrick. Mm. Now, I understand her marketability, but when your driver is never winning any races, except for that one, which I'll get to in a second, and she's always crashing out of every race she enters untouched, you know, it begins to wonder what's going to happen with that. You know, eventually you're going to want to win races. And I was telling um, this gentleman that I said, first off, number one, she's not a good driver. I said, there are multiple people in both Indy Racing League and NASCAR who stated that it, quote unquote, if she was a dude, she would be out of a driving job a long time ago. She's just not a good driver. Plus, there are documented incidents of her being a total jackass to her fans. Mm. And that's something you should never do as a driver, to be honest with you, when you start cursing out your fans, just asking for an autograph. And this person said to me, well, can you drive an Indy car that goes 200 miles an hour, six inches from each other? Then you need to be quiet. I'm like, really? So I have to drive a race car? Well, actually obviously, coming about it. obviously, all the people who are fans, you know, have an opinion about about racing. So that's just, yeah, it's ridiculous that the idea that you have to have direct experience with something just to have an opinion on it. You know, I mean, I like not that I don't think it's not important to listen to people with experience, but I mean, you're allowed to have an opinion about anything you want. I mean, you know, freedom of speech. Oh, I agree. It's just the fact that when my opinion is backed up by the fact that there are people in the industry who didn't approve of her driving, that says something. Um, that would basically be like me and a fellow football fan talking about um, a boneheaded play that a coach made. And I was explaining how boneheaded it was. And this guy looking at me and saying, well, are you a player or coach? Then be quiet. You know, you don't have like I don't have to be a player or coach to realize when a football team made a great play or a boneheaded play. But that's all I want to say about that, because, well, there isn't much to say. Oh, by the way, just so you know, Danica Patrick, when she won that one race, she did. It was on a fuel saver. The two guys ahead of her slowed down and pulled into pit row because they were supposedly low on fuel. Mm. How are you a professional race car driver and leave your previous pit row? with a half a tank of fuel. There's a lot of speculation that they were told to do that to let her win. I don't want to get into that though, because you know, her fans would probably hassle me about, but <laughs> now I want to get into something that I've been wanting to talk about for a little bit here. And that is music. You're a singer and mm -hmm. a pretty good one. I must say. Oh, thank you. And I just want to get into a couple of things here because there is political correctness in the music scene. And but it seems to be weirdly placed. And the reason why I say it's weirdly placed is because I'll give you a prime example of this. I know someone who's a drummer in one of those cover bands in like central Northern Florida. And he announced on Facebook one time that he was going, that his band was going to start performing Jimi Hendrix songs. And I jokingly asked him this. I wasn't serious here. I was just asking this as a joke. 
I said, let me guess, the venues won't let you perform uh, Hey Joe because the lyrics are too triggering for some. And I was joking. I wasn't serious. I just asked it to him as a joke. And he goes, yep. And for that exact reason. The song came out in 1967. Are we really going to start judging the, the works of years past by the standards of today? Right. And what I don't get is female rappers like Cardi B can make songs about their rape fantasy, their WAP. And that's perfectly acceptable. I don't get it. And by the way, Cardi B, I remember when she admitted that when before she was famous, she it, she she admitted that before she was famous, she would have a habit of honey potting men, drugging them and robbing them. I think I remember that. And you know what? Why do I have a feeling that that if a man came out, if a male singer admitted that, he would probably be canceled and had his career pulled a long time ago? Now, I'm not saying that as a slight against her being female. I'm just saying that political correctness makes it kind of hard to cancel someone. Now, I don't want to get too um, involved as to why I think that she, that nobody actually tried canceling her. But it's just the fact of the matter that she was able to say it and everyone was like, eh. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Honestly, like, there's just some things that really shock me. Like, have you heard of the baby? Uh, yeah, I he, think he made like a homophobic comment. I think was that the yeah, one? Yeah. Well, well, I know about it because Dave Chappelle was was joking about it, uh, and so you know, the baby got canceled. I love because, Chappelle. I don't care who likes it. <laughs> not because he. Um, killed a man in in walmart but because he made a homophobic statement you know it's, it's not because he killed someone but it was because he was mean to gay people it was basically you know dave Chappelle's joke and I, i'm not saying either of those things are okay obviously but yeah it's kind of uh it's kind of hard to know like what someone will get canceled for and and not you know it's just it's, it seems kind of random sometimes and not, not actually based on like the severity of what they did I don't know if you can hear it through the mic, but I just sighed. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I got to say that one thing about music that I don't understand is, listen, I'm 39. I like some music that are, you know, from the 50s, 60s, whatever. My musical taste is very varied in that manner. And one thing that I'm amazed at is the fact that, listen, I understand that record companies are a business and that they have to sell what's in demand. But What's in demand is why is there so much vapid crap that gets passed off as music? Now, listen, I understand that there's talent going on in all forms of music. I just don't understand, to be honest with you, why a lot of the great bands oftentimes get accused of being targeted towards a limited audience while these pop divas that can't sing and have to be enhanced through autotune get these huge venues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are, well, are you talking about like, you know, bands, older bands that, you know, maybe some of their lyrics aren't what's acceptable today? No, um, what I'm, I'll give you a prime example of what I'm talking about. And there's some people that like to counteract me by mentioning Metallica, but I'll give you a prime example. There is a, there is a trio, all girl band called The Warning. Mm. I recently got into them and, you know, these Three light-skinned Latina girls from Mexico kick ass. And to me, they would be much better role models than Cardi B because they sing, including their drummer. And playing drums and singing, I can, I can imagine, is really tough to do. And the only time they play large venues is when they have to tour as an opening act for bands like the Foo Fighters. But when they tour by themselves, they are relegated to small clubs. Mm. meanwhile yeah. You ha yeah meanwhile you have these these pop divas that can't sing without the help of autotune selling out huge venues i think it has more to do with what they're selling versus you know not to shame anybody but um i i think it all has to do with just the money again follow the money like you said um and you know the narrative is that sex sells and um you know 
it's, it's, yeah, it's not so much about talent and, um, you know, I will, I will admit, like, I, I did think WAP was catchy. <laughs> I think some of Cardi B stuff is catchy. And, um, you know, when I, I'm on TikTok and I, I don't know, like, I, like, I, I, I enjoy her music to like some extent, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think, um, I don't think the hypersexualization of women is empowering. You know, I, like, I don't really agree with the message. I mean, you know, I, I think, women, you know, feeling empowered and feeling um, comfortable in their sexuality is fine. But, you know, I, I don't think like the glorification of sex work um, and stuff like that is really where, like, I, I don't think it's empowering for women. Um, and so, you know, that is part of the popularity of artists like that is just this narrative. It's, it's like this narrative to try to destigmatize um, sex work. So you raise a good point. I wasn't going to bring it up, but you raise a good point. But first, I want to mention something that you said about that. I tried listening to Cardi B's WAP because I want to get a good idea of what I'm bashing. Right. I listened <laughs> to it. I got through it for about one minute and I had to stop because I was afraid that my ears were going to file assault charges on me. <laughs> All right. But well, it's different when you're um, well, my friend's a DJ who does kind of she does like spiritual stuff, but she also does like hip hop. Um, what does she call it? Like, I don't know, a ratchet spiritual or something like that. <laughs> I forget what she calls it, but um, so I don't know. It's different when you're like on the dance floor or at a festival or something, and um, you know, and everyone's kind of like grooving to it. You know, you know, I gotta say um, about what you were saying about Cardi B and you know sexualization and stuff. Now, look, I'm not going to lie and say that I don't watch porn, but I will say this. One thing about Cardi B that I don't that I've always said about not just her videos, I'm talking about like Nicki Minaj and all those all those um, artists. Look, don't insult my intelligence. And what I mean by that is if I'm going to watch an adult film, I'm going to put on an adult film. I'm not going to don't insult my intelligence by basically turning up the raunch in your music video to the point where it borders on a bad softcore porn scene just to distract from the mediocre quality of the lyrics or the song or anything else like that. I can always tell when, when, when a record label insults my intelligence by doing that. It's like going to a, a to me, the closest thing I could think of is it's like going to one of those overhyped tourist trappy restaurants mm. and the food tastes good in the restaurant but as soon as you eat the leftovers the next day, you're like, what the hell's going on? Why did it taste so much better in the restaurant? And that's because they overdid the ambiance to so that you can be distracted from so that your senses, it'll, it'll distract from the mediocre quality of the food. And some music videos definitely are done to distract from the mediocre quality of the music. That's true. Now, now I want to get to something that you mentioned in just a moment here, but I want to mention something here about a week or two ago. No, last week on Monday, I shared um, two videos of two female fronted bands that I like, which, by the way, just so you know, Europe seems to have a stranglehold on great rock and metal with here. It's all about country rap and stuff. But one of them is a band from Serbia called The Big Deal. If their entire album is like anything from the first two songs that it's going to be great. And I pre-ordered it immediately. And there's another um singer who has up until now done all covers from the Ukraine, which I know their country is going through some stuff, prayers to them a lot. But I shared within an hour of the of the other group, I shared it. And then I received a DM from somebody I don't know who basically told me, you know what, as a matter of fact, um, let me go on my Facebook and it's loading slow. Oh, there we go. Never mind. My apologies. Basically, what happened was is that he basically said the first band, the big deal. They said this gentleman actually said that the problem with that band is their music is too generic. It's catchy, but it's not groundbreaking or anything. And this band, the big deal, I must know, has two female vocalists. One of them is their keyboard player. She's pretty badass. But this guy was saying that this band needs a gimmick to, to, mm. to basically get people to tune in and view and buy their album and having two female vocalists is their gimmick. 
then he was talking about the other um, singer I was referring to, and he made the a comment that I'm that I think is sexist, saying that if she didn't look like a sports illustrated swimsuit model, you wouldn't notice her. And it took me back to a DM I received um, last year. There is a female guitar player from Texas by the name of Allie Venable. She's really good. But then somebody sent me a direct message saying, you know, she's a good guitar player, but if she was a dude with the same guitar skills, she wouldn't have any albums out. He would probably be stuck in a bar playing in front of 10 people. So that's probably the reason why you like her so much. And that leads me to a question that I want to ask. Male singers don't seem to have this problem where people accuse like a good amount of their fan base of being just simps who are liking them because they're attractive. What's your opinion? Um, I mean, I do think that um, I think on the pressure on women in, in general to like put more value on physical appearance is like pretty ubiqui ubiquitous. And when it comes to like any type of job and entertainment you know I just unfortunately well not even like it's just the way it is right like um appearance is a huge part of it if, if you're going to be like any kind of performer and the pressure is more on on women than it is on men but you know I I don't know like I I do think it happens with men too though like I just I think about these like these like boy bands and you know I don't know k-pop and just how much like you have these like these girls like standing, you know, certain members of these groups. And, you know, I mean, maybe some of it's about talent, but I do think a lot of it is about having a particular like aesthetic. I do well. to so, a degree. Like, I do think it's like both, but I, I do agree with you that it's, it's more so women. Um, I will say the one thing though. Um, and the reason why I didn't say boy bands is because manufactured boy bands are a little bit different than actual um. Um, male musicians. You never heard of Bruce Springsteen having that problem. You never heard of um, John Mellencamp having that problem. You never heard of a lot of the classic rock staples having the problem of being accused of, oh, you're just popular because 80% of your fans are just, you know, drooling fangirls. That, that, yeah. problem, that problem seems to happen only with, um, with female musicians. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say that, you know, I don't think that these female musicians that I mentioned are beautiful, but if a female musician is attractive, to me, that's a bonus, not a main reason. You know, I don't base my, mus my musical taste on, you know, gender or looks or anything like that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a huge fan of the band Heart. Right. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's what I want to say about that. And, uh, She's got an incredible voice. Oh, um, Ann Wilson? I, yeah, I almost said Annie Lennox, but no, that's Eurythmics. Um, right, know, yeah. Eurythmics. By the way, speaking of how unfair it is that some uh, some bands see, I don't like how a lot of bands that have a great amount of talent are oftentimes, see, limited audience used to mean a curse word in the music industry. Now, limited audience really means a smaller but more discriminating crowd. You know, mm -hmm. to make a car analogy, Chevrolet sells a lot more Equinoxes and Traverses than the Chevy Corvette. But what do you think is going to be considered a collectible in 30 years? You know, that's the thing. Um, I'll give you an example. See, I don't know if you know who this person is. Her name is Flora Jansen. Mm, I'm and, not familiar. Okay. When you have a free moment, look her up. She's a... Um, She's a singer who, who was the front woman for a metal band by the name of Nightwish. Oh, okay. Uh, what, what is her last name again? Uh, Jansen. It's spelled with a J. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah um, people have actually recommended that I do a cover of, of Nightwish, but I, I, I haven't listened to any of their stuff. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. Start with Ghost Love Score. And if that's too long, you can do the uh, official live of, Ever of Everdream from Vakken 2013. But this isn't about the songs themselves. This is about the fact that when Nightwish plays in Europe, where they're from, they tour huge festivals, huge venues. And when they come here, they have to play venues like Florida's Revolution Live, which holds like maybe 1,300 people. It's insane to me how 
arguably one of the best singers in the world and one of the, and, and a band that has one of the best songwriters in the world has to be relegated to huge venue to small venues like that when they come here. That's just amazing to me in a bad way, obviously. Um, but I want to move on from that and talk about something that you mentioned just a moment ago, um, sex mm -hmm. work. Now, I understand that everybody has a um, opinion on it, some negative, some positive. Um, and back to the trans thing for a moment here. I know that you, I hate to use this term for her, but Helena seems to be a virulent anti-porn crusader. And when she posted that, so when she posted that um, extended amount of porn use can cause a person to have gender identity issues, I took it with a grain of salt. And listen, the porn industry is not without its problems. But the one thing I will say, however, is that the people who are saying that porn should be illegal, in my opinion, don't know what happens whenever places write laws that ban something just because a small group of people don't like it. You know, it didn't work for alcohol. And I actually made a blog about, you know, my thoughts on, you know, things that anti-porn crusaders say in a previous blog of mine. So I'm not going to get really too involved with it here. But, you know, when people say porn should be illegal, they need to look what happened in the past. You know, alcohol prohibition was a failure. The war on drugs has been a total failure. Um, places and countries that banned abortions actually had a severely detrimental opposite effect than what they thought. I think that the solution to something that you don't like or consider problem is not to say ban it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, just another thing about it. Um, I think that to me that there's a stigma on adult film stars. Listen, I, I'm not going to lie. I actually went to a couple of the exotic interventions down here in Florida. It helps when you have free tickets. And I talk to them. They're all very nice people and everything. I mean, you may not like the, even if you don't like the industry, don't hate the people that perform in it, you know? And I just don't, you know, understand some of the stuff that people, you know, throw that way. But, you know, it's people are allowed to have their opinion on it. And that's all I can say. Um, I think you mentioned that there is a, um, that, you know, there's a stigma around sex work and everything like that, but, you know, and there's, I, I know that there's a lot of problems surrounding it, but I don't know that shaming the people who actually work in the industry is the right thing to do. And, but what, uh, what is your opinion about this ridiculous notion that, um, that watching porn can cause someone to have gender identity issues later on? as Helena was saying one day? Um, I, well, there's a couple of different types of, of porn that, you know, you know, I haven't necessarily watched, well, I, I especially haven't, I mean, I, I'm not going to say I haven't ever watched porn. Um, I think most people have at some point, but, you know, I, um, just before I answer that, I'm just going to go back to the last, one of the last things you said, which is, um, I totally agree that that individual people participating um, in sex work or in porn, like I like I don't think we should judge those people. Um, like, and I understand why some women go into sex work and that it's able to, you know, they're able to earn money that way and they're able to, you know, be more comfortable economic economically. It can help people get out of poverty and like and and I understand that and like I I don't think that the judgment should be placed on the on the people involved but um you know i do think the industry is harmful to women um and i would like to see women having other options besides that i mean i just it's the fact that you know one of the tickets for like poor women to get out of poverty like one of the only things that they can do is go into sex work and you know people who have families or they have children and like single moms who have kids it's like they can, you know, try to work a full-time job while having children, or they can like do an OnlyFans thing or, and I, I just think the fact that those are the options is, is the problem. You know, I, like, I would, I would like to see there being more female empowerment that doesn't involve, you know, 
that type of work because I just think it's harmful. And I think a lot of people are choosing it that would not be choosing it if it weren't for the money. And so that's not, that's not truly consensual to me. If, um, you know, someone's only choosing to do it because of the money. Um, but so as far as like people developing gender dysphoria because of porn, I mean, I would like to see like more research on it personally, but I have heard from quite a few detransitioners that they had a, a porn addiction or um, they just saw the way women were treated in porn and it it made them, because, you know, when, when kids, because kids are seeing it younger and younger, right? And these are kids that haven't actually, I mean, hopefully haven't had sex and don't know what a like healthy, you know, sexual interaction between adults look like and they're seeing yeah I, I like, disagree with that you know you should never i don't understand why you know although i will say this blaming the porn industry for billy eilish exposed to porn at 11 is kind of similar to a man leaving the keys to his truck on his kitchen counter his son stealing it crashing it and then blaming the truck manufacturer although i do say this children should not be viewing pornography that's that's one thing me and you will definitely agree on this. You know, install a good web filter, monitor what your kids are doing. Um, but yeah, it's something that your kids should kids should stay away from. But anyway, back to what you were saying. The fact, I think it's more the fact that just technology is like available. Like kids are getting access to technology so much younger now than they used to. And, you know, like kids are getting iPhones or when they're eight years old or whatever, like they're getting devices so young and then you know, I think a lot of parents aren't aware of like what their child is actually viewing. Um, but yeah, like I think for young girls, like seeing porn at uh, at an age before you you've even you even have any idea like what regular healthy what a healthy sexual relationship is is like. Like I do think that it can make you afraid of you know of being a girl and of having that type of interaction with a man because you know, a lot of porn is like really violent and, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that type of, uh, that type of porn exists. Actually, I know it exists. I refuse to watch it. Um, not to be too yeah. TMI, but I only watch girl on girl. And the reason why is because every time I hear of a bad experience a porn actress had on set, it's always with a dude. You never hear of bad experiences on set with, when, when a woman scene partner was another woman which is kind of interesting to be honest with you, but that goes, but that actually goes to show that, you know, the industry needs to weed out these bad guys that, you know, just mistreat women on set. But I think your- a lot of it's like, I think a lot of it's independent, you know, like it's just, um, it's not a professional production. It's just uh, like, I don't know, these, these like porn sites that just have collections of things. Like, I think there's just so much on there that isn't regulated and just anyone can submit and uh, no pun intended. But um, so then the other thing I wanted to touch on is uh, so people who identify as, um, you know, they're, they're male people who are transitioning to female. um, You know, there is this, I have never watched it, but it is called sissy hypno porn. Um, I don't don't know if you've ever heard of that, but no, and um, I don't really want to look it up either. I'm afraid to. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd probably recommend not, but basically it is, it's, it's a type of fetish where, you know, basically these men are, are getting off on the idea of being forced to be like feminine and submissive and. Oh, Jesus. Um, not something you know, I would want to watch. Not, and, and like, that is just, you know, because every time you are, you know, masturbating to something, um, it's just making the fetishes like stronger like if you're if you're you know getting off to the idea of you being feminized and uh yeah i don't know uh it's like that's just reinforcing it so it's like to me that's a way to induce uh gender dysphoria in someone is to i mean i mean it's literally called hypno porn and like that is like oh, the purpose of it. what are they gonna think so of next i do think that for and I, you know i'm not saying all i'm not saying all trans identified males like, I'm not saying that at all, but I do see a high percentage of them where it seems to be wow. very fetishistic for them. Um, you know, it's, it's way different than like teenage girls that have, you know, gender dysphoria. Um, it, it's just, you can tell it's like a, a different thing. It's a different form of gender dysphoria. So 
So yeah, I think there's absolutely the possibility on both sides, like, you know, males and females transitioning that porn could influence it. But, you know, at the same time, like I, I, I do like to see research and I would see this issue. I'd like to see this issue be like looked into a bit more um, before like saying like, oh, that was just the sole reason for, you know, a person's gender transition. Like, I think that's maybe a bit reductive, but I, I do think it can be a factor. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. I was just about to mention, though, not funny, haha way, but it's interesting that you said that because I remember in Helena's Substack piece, she was saying how in certain cases when girls watch porn, they look at how some of the women, I'm not going to say that, you know, that the industry of of adult films is 100% ethical because it's not. But she was saying how in certain cases, you know, these teenage girls see how women are treated at times in, in the adult industry and they want to escape womanhood. And to them, escape means they can, they, they might, can, they can, they might consider transitioning. Um, now, as you said, man, that's a big glass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, you but can fill like half a bottle of, of wine in here. I don't, I don't drink alcohol anymore, but <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, it's interesting that you say that. And I know you said I would like to see studies on it. And I would say to anyone who would say something like that in that regard, good luck with that. And that's not a slight towards you. The reason why I say that is because if they were to come out with a study that would try to link a, the adult industry or watching adult films to people wanting to transition, it would be squashed by the by the by the trans rights activists because to them they would consider that harming the trans uh, community or harming the trans ideology, because then it would give credence to. Okay, if someone is being you know transitioning because of an underlying issue of you know being traumatized by porn or something, that wouldn't be looked at as fitting the narrative, unfortunately. Yeah. So it all goes back to that. Um, there was one last thing I'd like to mention here, and I'm sure you've probably seen it. I'm sure every human being on the earth has seen it. The Will Smith slap heard around the world. <laughs> now, one of the reasons why I want to get this in, I know this seems kind of off the wall to mention it like a, a week after it happened. But in my opinion, this wasn't a man that slapped another man. This was a man who felt emasculated by a woman who has not respected him for a long time. I mean, they went on national television. She explained how she cheated on him with a much younger guy. He just took it. And, you know, I know that simp is used as an insult in many areas. I think that Will Smith is a simp because he's basically stood by watching his wife disrespect him. And he was laughing at the joke. But if you notice, she wasn't. And I think what happened was is that she he looked at her and said, oh, better do something about it. And I guess that was his way of finally releasing frustration out of being emasculated. Hmm. But that's just my take. I don't know if you have anything different. I personally think that Chris Rock handled it really well. But anyway, your, your thoughts. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't really know. I, it sounds like you know more about like, you know, Will and Jada's relationship out, outside of that. Like, she I, called it an entanglement when she admitted to having an affair. An entanglement. Come on, just admit it. You cheated. You know? Yeah. I mean, I haven't really, I haven't really looked into that, but you know, that does sound, you know, it's never good to be cheated on. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, it's just, it's so privileged to be able to hit someone on national TV when it, it's like, you know, if it was in real life, uh, and it was just like a, your average person doing it. It's like the cops would probably be involved and that's literally like assault um, or battery rather. Um, so that's another thing about it too. He got away with it pretty much, but Chris Rock decided to decline to his charges. In front so. of, in yeah. Front of, you know, the whole world or most of the world. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, I thought Chris Rock handled it really well. I mean, the show must go on and uh he looked a little stunned for just a second, but then he. Oh yeah, anybody would. So that was, yeah, that was good. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, anyway, um, we pretty much, you know, covered all we. I really wanted to cover here. Um, thank you very, very much for coming on to my little video here, and I hope this gets more than twenty views than like, my other videos have. But <laughs> anyway. Well, I think I can hopefully help you, um, I'll, you know, give you a shout out and maybe 
bring some more viewers in. Yep. But anyway, um, it was nice talking to you, Kat. I hope I don't mind calling Kat, but uh, like the show, call me Kat. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, um, nice talking to you. And uh, I hope to uh, maybe one day hear from you again soon. And I'll be sure to, you know, edit this and post it on my uh, YouTube, Facebook, everywhere else. But anyway, um, thank you very much. And um, that's pretty much, I know that you probably have a busy day. So I will uh, see, see you to it. And um, hopefully stay safe. And uh, you have a good rest of the week, okay? Thanks, Sam. You too. And thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. You have a good one, all right? Thanks, I will. All right, you're welcome. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.